a lot of people lose the perspective of this. It's a long, it's an old program. It's been in place for more than 60 years. But the implementation of this specific two laws, Act 20 and Act 22, just have 10 years. And in through this 10 years, a lot of changes have been enacted by the legislature of the laws, a lot of up and downs. And administrative-wise, it's, it's a nightmare. And mm. the executive director of the Office of Incentives it's been handling a justice past year of applications with less than 10, team of 10 people. Right. And he was recently in a CPA forum in the island and, and of the CPA Society of Puerto Rico. And he was mentioning this. He was, say, he was stating the facts and he was saying, we had few people working with this with thousands of cases and that he expects for 2020 three to change because he got an influx of capital and uh, people. But specifically to your point, there's been a lot of demand from the public and other sectors for, for fiscalization and more scrutiny. I'm here today with Janelle Alimar Escabi of JAE Law LLC. And Janelle has a history of working to support Puerto Rican tax incentives, working to improve the economy of Puerto Rico. And I'm grateful that you're on our show today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Peter. So the incentive programs, which have now been all rolled into X60, are not just about luring tax weary Americans or mainlanders to Puerto Rico. They're really a framework and a 400 page framework in the TDEC website of, of various incentives, a quilt or framework of incentives to lure large businesses, small businesses, investors, professionals to Puerto Rico to essentially improve the economic conditions of Puerto Rico. That is correct. And thank you for asking that. There is a lot of misconceptions about the program. Just to mention a little bit of history about this program, the first incentive law in Puerto Rico was approved in 1947. And initially the program was intended to create a, a economic activity in the manufacturing, manufacturing sector. That's what allowed Puerto Rico to become, to transform from an basically mainly agricultural basis to now highly developed manufacturing industry based economy. As a matter of fact, more than 40% of the revenues of the Puerto Rico Treasury Department comes from this mm. exempt businesses in the manufacturing. And we have, as you know, multinationals working in Puerto Rico and have been had presence in Puerto Rico for years now, under, previously under Section 936. And after that, under the Puerto Rico Incentive Program. What happens, I think I have, it has happened, is that after the benefits of Section 936, which were complement of the Puerto Rico Incentives Manufacturing Program, phased out, the Puerto Rico government needed something else because essentially most of the revenue started to decrease as some of this multinational decided to relocate to other more beneficial jurisdictions. So back in 2010, and I can attest to this because I had the privilege to be part of the team that worked with this, the back then Secretary of Economic Development and Commerce with his team decided to look for alternatives. And they found a provision in the Act 73 of 2008, which was the manufacturing incentive back then, which was the only one available back then that provided a special incentive for the exportation of services. Essentially, what he did was spin out that, that provision and created Act 20. Alongside with Act 20 was considered another alternative, which was attracting investors to Puerto Rico. And this was, mm -hmm. to me, a, a, a game changer because so far, all the incentives being considered and provided were to businesses. But for the first time, the government of Puerto Rico think about 
attracting investors and attracting that mindset and that ecosystem that comes with the big investors to the island. But for the first time back in 2012, Act 22 is an act that providing a specific benefit for investors. Well, and let's we get into kind of some of the different aspects of these rules, but just to put them in perspective, with respect to their importance on the economy of Puerto Rico, you're talking about a economy that has a, or a, country, a territory that has a poverty rate that is twice the poorest state in the mainland. And, and the people, yet the people in Puerto Rico are generally entitled to a lower level of government support than their counterparts back in the U.S. So there's a challenge there from the standpoint of just the social kind of situation. On top of that, people in Puerto Rico or people born in Puerto Rico can and do easily move to the mainland to the point where there are 6 million people of Puerto Rican descent in the United States and 3 million Puerto Rican people in Puerto Rico. And this, you know, whether you call it a brain drain or whatever, this is also a, a challenge that needs to be back in Puerto Rico. And, and what you have here is a per capita GDP has been on the decline for 10 out of the last 11 years. Puerto Rico recently hit a 40 year population low. So am I overstating the case of the significance or importance of these incentives on the Puerto Rican economy? I don't think you are saying that you are on point. And, and to add to that analysis, if you look at the numbers of the Puerto Rico economy throughout the years, Puerto Rico became dependent on the 936 incentives for the entire ecosystem. Not only the, the companies were creating a lot of work, but also the academia was being developed and to the point that the University of Puerto Rico has 11 campuses preparing the people, the, the workers for those manufacturing companies. And all of that has changed dramatically. Also, there are other factors to consider in, such as globalization, et cetera. But, uh, but in top of that, uh, the government of Puerto Rico, which was the, the other employer, big employer of the economy of Puerto Rico, the, the majority of the income is coming from the manufacturing industry too, from the incentive programs too. So, so this essentially was the pillar, has been the pillar of the Puerto Rico's, of Puerto Rico's economy for many years. Well, I think anytime you attract business, there's a multiplier effect because you have suppliers, you have Correct. restaurants that people eat at, you, you have a lot of small businesses supported Correct. by the larger businesses, and then you have that money cycling back through the system, back through the economy, you know, kind of multiple times as all of those people have a role in this ecosystem. So losing a couple hundred jobs here or there really can add up. Um, and, and that is potentially what's going on right now. You mentioned the challenges from tax policy change. I think one of the most threatening elements is the, what's called pillar two or the global tax initiative to try to get everybody up to a minimum 15% tax rate and discourage, if not eliminate cross crediting of income and taxes, which has really allowed companies U.S. companies, mainland companies, or foreign companies to continue to enjoy the benefit of the incentives, you know, whether it's 4% or whatever the incentives are, without having, you know, to pay that top up today, even if you have things like guilty in the U.S. and other tax law changes, negative tax law changes, there really has been some life in these provisions, continued life in these provisions, which the now Pillar 2 or Global Tax Initiative just seems to want to snuff out. Yes. However, I still think that Puerto Rico presents some advantages because Puerto Rico is within the U.S. jurisdiction. So in terms of competitiveness, mm. you have the protections of the U.S. federal laws. You have the, Puerto, the U.S. banking system. So when a business makes a decision like this and everything else becomes uniform, then I think it's, it's not such a bad idea to consider Puerto Rico because if it's going to be at the same rate than other jurisdiction in which I don't have the, the, uh, the political protections that I have within the U.S. jurisdiction, why not? Mm -hmm. But kind of what do you say to Microsoft who's actually pulling business out 
closing their Puerto Rican plant. I, I don't have the details on why would they do that, but just, and, and I don't have the details for the transaction, but I act on circumstances and, and, and looking at the tendency of scrutinizing more and more the, 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 the big companies that have facilities within lower tax jurisdiction, it makes sense to me that they may want to capitalize on any possible built-in gains that they would have within the island before Pillar 2 or any other type of global system is implemented. Yeah, and part of that might just be that the products they were making in Puerto Rico are entering that end-of-life stage, whether it's CDs or DVDs. But according to their 2022 financial report, they transferred around $20 billion. I don't know the exact number, but they assigned the value of the intellectual property of Puerto Rico to be somewhere in the $20 billion range and took a $3 billion tax benefit from transferring that back to the U.S., which might be a bit of a precursor or roadmap on what other large companies might be doing in the run-up to Pillar 2 becoming effective. I, to my knowledge, these multinationals have huge international tax departments that yeah. are very way ahead in their analysis on, on what the next moves will be. So <laughs> I, I used to be one of those people. <laughs> very case in point. And then from like a political standpoint, you've got, I think Senator Chuck Schumer talked about the Act 2022 benefits, and he called them BS. He used the actual term, formal term for that. And then AOC was part of the letter writing campaign to Treasury, expressing concern about how these incentives in Puerto Rico might just kind of be a runaway tax loophole. Is that just political posturing? Because I know both of those people have, have ambitions. And uh, there's also this bigger issue of statehood that kind of floats around. I mean, is that just kind of political posturing or could that type of talk have a chilling effect on the incentives? Well, having been in, in politics myself for a little while, I, I know that every opportunity to carry out a political agenda, it's, it's most of the time taken by politicians. However, this is not just a matter of Act 22 or now Chapter 2 within Act 60 yeah. because that's where the most contained right it's 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 right now but the reason for the 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 foundation of this benefit lies in section 933 of the US code this is not new this is not from mm. 2012 this is not this is not born with 22 all US citizens that are that reside even if they're not born but they reside in Puerto Rico are not subject to US federal income taxes with respect to Puerto Rico source income. And the reason for that is because there's no taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's not accurate to say that this program, Act 22, is an incentive to not be non-compliant with the United States federal laws. On the contrary, this has been in place for many years, and us U.S. citizens that reside in Puerto Rico haven't paid income taxes on, for example, services provided in Puerto Rico, with some exceptions, for years, for years. I agree. I, I tell people Act, Section 933 is not a loophole. Correct. Because loopholes don't affect 3 million people. Correct. So if you're compliant, you're compliant. If you're not compliant, you're not compliant. That's true with any tax provision. I mean, I understood, I understand historically medical professionals in Puerto Rico have been granted a 4% incentive to remain in Puerto Rico. And I, I wonder whether the IRS is, is considering, I mean, a lot of those people may have second residences in the U.S. They may have children in boarding school in the U.S. They could even have spouses in the U.S. You know, are they getting the same level of scrutiny as these crypto investors, for example? Well, well that was part of the incentive that the Puerto Rico government provided for a short period of time to, to keep these professionals in the island because, again, open the, the Elimination of Section 930, that started uh, a snowball of events mm. that have uh, increased uh, Puerto Rico's economic crisis. Um, I do believe that it's not a loophole. I think it's, uh, it's just tax policy. It's been yeah. a tax policy of the United States for a long time with respect to Puerto Rico. And if the, poor, if the U.S. Congress and I, the IRS wants to revise that policy, they are in the right to do so at any time. 
What's the local sentiment around these incentives? Because I was not greeted by protesters at the airport when I showed up, but I do understand that there are people here that protest against the Act 22, in some cases, maybe Act 20 investors or business people. There are like 3,000 of those investors and business people. And so it seems hard to believe they're reshaping the Puerto Rican economy in a material way, considering it's 6 million Puerto Ricanos in the United States of Puerto Rican descent. What are your, what are your you know, like views of that initiative or, or the, the seriousness I, uh, of it? Like, like with every, like with every pro, you have, you're going to have detractors. That's, that's a granted. Puerto Rican community, it's very vocal and, 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 and sometimes we are loud. That's part of our culture. So mm -hmm. we are going to mm -hmm. make noise and people that are against it for many reasons have been very vocal about it not only by creating groups and protesting, but also in the media, that it's another fact, something to factor in. Mm. Media has become one of the primary, if not the primary source of, of, of information for many people. So, sure. so, so the same, the same group of people protesting 20 years ago, wouldn't have had the level of attention that we've had these days because of the different ways of communicating. But obviously, yes, there is a group that are not happy with the situation, but I don't think that that necessarily represents the majority of the population. Yeah. So, so the girl in the room is statehood, anything you want to, I mean, which is a related, if you're going to be for or against a political position in Puerto Rico, it's probably going to be statehood at this point in time. It's got to be one of the hottest issues here. Is that talked about seriously or is that like so far down the line or just like out of the out of the well bounds? legally puerto rico is a territory that yeah. the u.s acquired in eight in 1898 mm -hmm. uh, for 10 for 20 million dollars actually when you think about it and so it's back in 1952 when the puerto rico political leaders want to discuss the situation in Puerto Rico, they came up with an, with the formula that worked beautifully for mm. Puerto Rico mm. for 40, 50 years, 70 years, but it's not working anymore. Yeah. So younger generations have, that have had a lot, much more influence from the, from America are more attuned with the idea of statehood and, and, and more ready to, to allow for, you know, incorporated to for Puerto Rico to become an incorporated territory. But obviously, this is not a Puerto Rico decision. As of it is legally right now, this needs to come from the from Congress. Yes, right. So even for the, uh, most of the population in Puerto Rico, uh, evidenced by the uh, elections results, are in favor of statehood. It's something that needs to be to, to be approved and and promoted by Congress. Yeah, and it wouldn't be unprecedented because Hawaii and Alaska were territories that became states. It's not. And even in the case of Hawaii, my understanding is, and this goes back to like ancient history now, 1959, but when they became a state, some of their local incentives were grandfathered. So like, even if it, uh, Puerto Rico were to become a state in the next two to five years, you know, it might not be the end of some of these incentive programs. Yes. And this is definitely a very good question. A lot of people ask me, what if it becomes a state? Well, first and foremost, this is, if Puerto Rico were to become a state, I would have to believe that this would be a process that would take some time, years. And in the meantime, the, 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 the people can do business in that one yeah. uh, within the framework of, of the program, number one. Number two, as you said, most of these programs have grandfather clause that would apply to the business and that are already doing business in Puerto Rico. And one of also the things that I mentioned is this is not just about the the big, the small and medium sized business that relocate to Puerto Rico to provide consulting service. Again, we're talking about multinationals being doing business in Puerto Rico for a long time yeah. that had a lot of interest in keeping a sustainable and, and a, you know, reasonable long-term business in the island and, uh, and, and stability, stability mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. their business. So even if statehood happens, which if it happens, it's not going to happen immediately. Business that are, businesses that are located in Puerto Rico under the program, more likely than not, in my opinion, would be grandfather and we still benefit from the program. Good, good news, good information. 
for people that have already kind of committed to Puerto Rico. A more proximate threat, and speaking kind of the media, but there was a media report about the development department, DDEC, revoking hundreds of investor certificates, contracts effectively. Now, I understand that a lot of people who get the contracts don't actually decide to move to Puerto Rico or they move and say, like, I'm getting out of here. This isn't for me. And so is this the DDEC just kind of cleaning up their files with respect to people who un unfulfilled contracts or is there something more aggressive going on here? I, I, so yes, I think that there's a lot of cleaning up the house, but there's also been audit because I, I've seen how the audits have been, how audits been developed. And I'd also, you know, clients that come down to Puerto Rico and because they're not used to being in compliance with certain filings, just for the mere fact of being a resident of a place, they right. just don't comply. And uh, mm -hmm. so they have to be reminded that you, you are a Puerto Rico resident, but you have certain responsibilities in terms of compliance. It is interesting that this program has been around for over 10 years now, and you're only talking about, say, 3,000 people, you know, 60 persons per state in the U.S. that have taken advantage of it. I guess some people might say that's not a very successful program. And now when you're talking about 1,000 applicants a year, you can say, well, okay, finally, you know, gotten to the point where it's working better. And yet at the same time, now everybody's kind of crashing on it a little bit. What's the right balance? You know, when are people going to say like, okay, now it's really working and it's not running away from us? I think that this is kind of when you are scaling a business, mm -hmm. you need to be prepared for volume. Yeah. And the Puerto Rico government was not prepared for volume and, 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 and it's barely handling the volume that they have. So yeah. mm -hmm. that the program has the, the, the ability to attract thousand and, 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 and hundreds sure. of thousands of people. Yes. This is the only jurisdiction within the, I mean, in the world that a U.S. citizen can't avoid paying legally right. U.S. federal income taxes and at the same time create value for an economy that desperately needs it. So it's, it's a no-brainer. And every time I describe this program to people, they really ask me twice, are, are you sure where, where's the catch? Is this too good to be true? No, it's there. Not without its challenges, of course, because you're coming to a place where there's a lot of needs, but a lot of opportunities too. So, so I do think that the government of Puerto Rico is catching up with, with their roles on, on not only issuing the credit, issuing the incentives, but also fiscalizing and, 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 uh, and overseeing the program and overseeing the grantees. Do you think they appreciate the fact that with all of these pressures, it's possible that the ambitions of Act 60 will never be fully realized? My personal opinion is that this is just getting started. <laughs> in a good way. In a good way. In a good way. 10 years ago, when I started doing this, I, and, and it, it was, it was a good idea. It was a good idea that it was never intended be a substitute for 936, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. although that was one of the concerns, the government and advisors were very much aware of the difference in terms of cr job creation. However, it has become something very interesting and attractive to a lot of people, again, for circumstances that are not related to the Puerto Rico government, such as yeah. COVID. Right. Uh, before COVID, how much of the population were aware of the possibility of working remotely? Mm -hmm. Ex Chapter 3 of Act 60, which provides an incentive for the exportation of service, relies on the fact that the people can provide services remotely. And that was before COVID. Once COVID, COVID hits, it, it, it's an explosion of, of, of remote work. And that makes relocation to Puerto Rico much more, e much more easier. So, so I do think that not only the program has grown because it, it, it makes sense to a lot of people, but because it makes sense to much more people now than it, than it did at the beginning. I think the other thing that could come out of this and be a positive over the next couple of years is this attention from the DDC, DDEC catching up 
the IRS and now putting some more attention on this. You know, we're now starting to see some clarification of rules that have just been very vague over the last 10 years. And I think that clarification might be quite helpful for people who just want that level of confidence to say, let's do this. And I'm a fan of rules. I, I yeah. love them because it gives you a clear guidance of well, what do you need to do in order to be in compliance so that you can relax and, 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 and run your business. And, 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 and I believe that that also would attract bigger businesses and, uh, and it would create the much needed credibility that, that the program and, and the island needs. Well, I always tell people a law can be your best friend or your worst enemy, depending on which side of it you're on. And it's great that you help. It's great you help people keep on the right side of these incentive provisions. So thank you very much for coming on the show. My pleasure. And uh, thank you for inviting me. This has been Taking Shelter. I'm your host, Peter Paulson, on location in Puerto Rico.